Chapter 68 While I was in Honolulu, I witnessed the ceremonious funeral of the king's sister, Her Royal Highness the Princess Victoria. According to the royal custom, the remains had lain in state at the palace thirty days, watched day and night by a guard of honor, and during all that time a great multitude of natives from the several islands had kept the palace grounds well crowded and had made the place a pandemonium every night with their howlings and wailings beating of tom-toms and dancing of that at other times forbidden hula hula by half-clad maidens to the music of songs of questionable decency chanted in honor of the deceased the printed program of the funeral procession interested me at the time, and after what I've just said of the Hawaiian grand eloquence in the matter of playing empire, I am persuaded that a perusal of it may interest the reader. After reading the long list of dignitaries, etc., and remembering the sparseness of the population, one is almost inclined to wonder where the material for that portion of the procession devoted to Hawaiian population generally is going to be procured. Undertaker, Royal School, Kawahau School, Roman Catholic School, May May School, Honolulu Fire Department, Mechanics Benefit Union, Attending Physicians, Konohikis, those are superintendents, of the crowned lands, Konohikis of the private lands of His Majesty, Konohikis of the private lands of Her Late Royal Highness, Governor of Oahu and Staff, Hulumanu, military company, Household Troops, the Prince of Hawaii's own military company, the king's household servants, servants of her late royal highness, Protestant clergy, the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church, his lordship Louis Magret, the right reverend bishop of Arethia, vicar apostolic of the Hawaiian Islands, the clergy of the Hawaiian Reformed Catholic Church, his Lordship the Right Reverend Bishop of Honolulu, Her Majesty Queen Emma's Carriage, His Majesty's Staff, Carriage of Her Late Royal Highness, Carriage of Her Majesty the Queen Dowager, The King's Chancellor, Cabinet Ministers, His Excellency the Minister Resident of the United States, HBM's Commissioner, HBM's Acting Commissioner, Judges of Supreme Court, Privy Councilors, Members of Legislative Assembly, Consular Corps, Circuit Judges, Clerks of Government Departments, Members of the Bar, Collector General, Custom House Officers, and Officers of the Customs, Marshal and Sheriffs of the Different Islands, King's Yeomanry, Foreign Residents, Ahua Kahomanu, Hawaiian population generally, Hawaiian cavalry, and police force. I resumed my journal at the point where the procession arrived at the Royal Mausoleum. As the procession filed through the gate, the military deployed handsomely to the right and left and formed an avenue through which the long column of mourners passed to the tomb. The coffin was borne through the door of the mausoleum, followed by the king and his chiefs. The great officers of the kingdom, foreign consuls, ambassadors, distinguished guests, Berlingame and General Van Valkenburg. Several of the Kahilis were then fastened to the framework in front of the tomb and there to remain until they decay and fall to pieces, or forestalling this, until another scion of the royal of the royalty dies. At this point of the proceedings, the multitude set up such a heartbroken wailing as I hope never to hear again. 
The soldiers fired three volleys of musketry, the wailing being previously silenced to permit the guns being heard. His Highness Prince William, in a showy military uniform, he's the true prince, the scion of the house overthrown by the present dynasty. He was formerly betrothed to the princess, but was not allowed to marry her. Stood guard and paced back and forth within the door. The privileged few who followed the coffin into the mausoleum remained some time, but the king soon came out and stood in the door near one side of it. A stranger could have guessed his rank, although he was so simply and unpretentiously dressed, by the profound deference paid him by all persons in his vicinity. By seeing his high officers receive his quiet orders and suggestions with bowed and uncovered heads, and by observing how careful those persons who came out of the mausoleum were to avoid crowding him, although there was room enough in the doorway for a wagon to pass, for that matter. How respectfully they edged out sideways, scraping their backs against the wall, and always presenting a front view of their persons to His Majesty, and never putting their hats on until they were well out of the royal presence. He was dressed entirely in black, dress coat, silk hat, and looked rather democratic in the midst of the showy uniforms about him. On his breast he wore a large gold star, which was half hidden by the lapel of his coat. He remained at the door a half hour, and occasionally gave an order to the men who were erecting the kahilis before the tomb. Ranks of long, handled mops made of gaudy feathers, sacred to royalty, they're stuck in the ground around the tomb and left there. He had the good taste to make one of them substitute black crepe for the ordinary hempen rope he was about to tie one of them to the framework with. Finally he entered his carriage and drove away, and the populace shortly began to drop into his wake. While he was in view, there was but one man who attracted more attention than himself, and that was Harris the Yankee Prime Minister. This feeble personage had crape enough around his hat to express the grief of an entire nation, and as usual he neglected no opportunity of making himself conspicuous and exciting the admiration of the simple Kanakas. O oh, noble ambition of this modern Richelieu! It is interesting to contrast the funeral ceremonies of the Princess Victoria with those of her noted ancestor, Kamehameha the Conqueror, who died 50 years ago in 1819, the year before the first missionaries came. On the 8th of May, 1819, at the age of 66, he died as he had lived in the faith of his country. It was his misfortune not to have come in contact with men who could have rightly influenced his religious aspirations. Judged by his advantages and compared with the most eminent of his countrymen, he may be justly styled not only great but good. To this day his memory warms the heart and elevates the national feelings of Hawaiians. They are proud of their old warrior king, they love his name. His deeds form their historical age, and an enthusiasm everywhere prevails, shared even by foreigners who knew his worth, that constitutes the firmest pillar of the throne of his dynasty. In lieu of human victims, the custom of that age, a sacrifice of 300 dogs attended his obsequies. No mean holocaust when their national value and the estimation in which they were held are considered. The bones of Kamehameha, after being kept, and kept for a while, were so carefully concealed that all knowledge of their final resting place is now lost. There was a proverb current among common people that the bones of a cruel king could not be hid. They made fish hooks and arrows of them, 
upon which in using them they vented their abhorrence of his memory in better execrations. The account of the circumstances of his death as written by the native historians is full of minute detail, but there is scarcely a line of it which does not mention or illustrate some bygone custom of the country. In this respect, it is the most comprehensive document I have yet met with. I will quote it entire. When Kamehameha was dangerously sick and the priests were unable to cure him, they said, Be of good courage and build a house for the god, his own private god or idol, that thou mayest recover. The chiefs corroborated this advice of the priests, and a place of worship was prepared for Kukolamuku and consecrated in the evening. They proposed also to the king, with a view to prolong his life, that human victims should be sacrificed to his deity, upon which the greater part of the people absconded through fear of death and concealed themselves in hiding places till the taboo in which destruction impended was passed. Taboo means prohibition. We have borrowed it. Or sacred. The taboo was sometimes permanent, sometimes temporary, and the person or thing placed under taboo was for the time being sacred to the purpose for which it was set apart. In the above case, the victim selected under the taboo would be sacred to the sacrifice. It is doubtful whether Kamea may have approved of the plan of the chiefs and priests to sacrifice men, as he was known to say, the men are sacred for the king meaning that they were for the service of his successor. This information was derived from the Holo, Laho, his son. After this, his sickness increased to such a de degree that he had not strength to turn himself in his bed. When another season consecrated for worship at the new temple arrived, he said to his son, Laho, Laho, Go thou and make supplication to thy God. I am not able to go and will offer my prayers at home. When his devotions to his feathered God, Kuklomoko, were concluded, a certain religiously disposed individual who had a bird God suggested to the king that through its influence his sickness might be removed. The name of this God was Pua. Its body was made of a bird now eaten by the Hawaiians and called in their language Allah. Kamehameha was willing that a trial should be made and two houses were constructed to facilitate the experiment, but while dwelling in them he became so very weak as not to receive food. After lying there three days, his wives, children, and chiefs perceiving that he was very low, returned him to his own house. In the evening he was carried to the eating house, where he took a little food in his mouth, which he did not swallow, also a cup of water. The chiefs requested him to give them his counsel, but he made no reply and was carried back to the dwelling house. But when near midnight, ten o'clock perhaps, he was carried again to the place to eat, but was, as before, merely tasted of what was presented to him. Then Kwakiwa addressed him thus, Here we all are, your younger brethren, your son Lahoy Lahoy, and your foreigner. Impart to us your dying charge, that Lahoy and Lahoy and Kahumanu may hear. And Kamehameha inquired, What do you say? Kwakawa repeated, Your counsel's for us. He then said, Move on in my good way, and he could proceed no further. The foreigner, Mr. Young, embraced and kissed him. Hupali also embraced him and whispered something in his ear, after which he was taken back to the house. About twelve he was carried once more to the house of eating, into which his head entered while his body was in the dwelling house immediately adjoining. 
It should be remarked that this frequent carrying of a sick chief from one house to another resulted from the taboo system then in force. There were, at that time, six houses, huts, connected with an establishment. One was for worship, one, was, one for the men to eat in, eating house for the women, a house to sleep in, a house in which to manufacture kappa, native cloth, and one where at certain intervals the women might dwell in seclusion. The sick was once more taken to his house when he ex expired. This was at two o'clock, a circumstance from which Liliohuku derived his name. And as he breathed his last, Kalamuku came to the eating house to order those in it to go out. There were two aged persons thus directed to depart. One went. The other remained on account of love to the king, by whom he had formerly been kindly sustained. The children also were sent away. Then Kalamuku came to the house, and the chiefs had a consultation. One of them spoke thus, It is my thought that we eat him raw. This sounds suspicious in view of the fact that all Sandwich Island historians, white and black, protest that cannibalism never existed in the islands. However, since they only proposed to eat him raw, we won't count that. But it would be certainly have been cannibalism if they had cooked him. Mark Twain. Kahumanu, one of the dead king's widows, replied, Perhaps his body is not at our disposal, that is, more properly with his successor. Our part in him, his breath, has departed. His remains will be disposed of by Lahoi Lahoi. After this conversation, the body was taken into the consecrated house for the performance of the proper rites by the priest and the new king. The name of this ceremony is Uku, and when the sacred hog was baked, the priest offered it to the dead body, and it became a god. The king, at the same time, repeating the customary prayers. Then the priest, addressing himself to the king and chief, said, I will now make known to you the rules to be observed respecting persons to be sacrificed on the burial of, his, of this body. If you obtain one man before the corpse is removed, one will be sufficient. But after it leaves this house, four will be required. If delayed until we carry the corpse to the grave, there must be ten. But after it is deposited in the grave, there must be fifteen. Tomorrow morning there will be a taboo, and if the sacrifice be delayed until that time, forty men must die. Then the high priest, Hewakewa, inquired of the chiefs, Where shall be the residence of King Lahoi Lahoi? They replied, Where indeed? You of all men ought to know. Then the priest observed, There are two suitable places. One is Kau, and the other is Kohala. The chiefs preferred the latter, as it was more thickly inhabited. The priest added, These are proper places for the king's residence, but he must not remain in Kona, for it is polluted. This was agreed to. It was now break of day. As he was being carried to the place of burial, and the people perceived that the king was dead, and they wailed. When the corpse was removed from the house to the tomb, a distance of one chain, the procession was met by a certain man who ardently attached to the deceased. He leapt upon the chiefs who were carrying the king's body. He desired to die with him on account of his love, and the chiefs drove him away. He persisted in making numerous attempts, which were unavailing. Kalamoka also had it in his heart to die with him, but was prevented by Hokio. The morning following Kamehameha's death, Lahoi Lahoi and his train departed for Kohala, according to the suggestions of the priest, to avoid the defilement occasioned by the dead. At this time, if a chief died, the land was polluted, and their heirs sought a residence in another part of the country until the corpse was dissected and the bones tied in a bundle 
which being done, the season of defilement terminated. If the deceased were not a chief, the house only was defiled, which became pure again on the burial of the body. Such were the laws on the subject. On the morning on which Lahoy Lahoy sailed in his canoe for Kohala, the chiefs and people mourned after their manner on occasion of a chief's death, conducting themselves like madmen and like beasts. Their conduct was such as to forbid description. The priests also put into action the sorcery apparatus that the person who had prayed the king to death might die, for it was not believed that Kamehameha's departure was the effect of either sickness or old age. When the sorcerers set up their fireplaces, sticks with a strip of kappa flying at the top, the chief Kiamoku, Kahomanan's brother, came in a state of intoxication and broke the flagstaff of the sorcerers, from which it was inferred that Kahomanu and her friends had been instrumental in the king's death. On this account, they were subjected to abuse. You have the contrast now, and a strange one it is, this great queen, Kahomanu, who was subjected to abuse during the frightful orgies that followed the king's death, in accordance with ancient custom, afterwards became a devout Christian and a steadfast and powerful friend of the missionaries. Dogs were and still are reared and fattened for food by the natives, hence the reference to their value in one of the above paragraphs. Forty years ago it was the custom of the land to spend all law for a certain number of days after the death of a royal personage, and then a satinalia ensued, which one may picture himself after a fashion, but not in the full horror of the reality. The people shaved their heads, knocked out a tooth or two, plucked out an eye sometimes, cut, mutilated, or burned their flesh, got drunk, burned each other's huts, maimed or murdered one another according to the caprice of the moment, and both sexes gave themselves up to brutal and unbridled licentiousness. And after it all came a torbor which the nation slowly emerged, bewildered and dazed, as if from some hideous half-remembered nightmare. They were not the salt of the earth, those gentle children of the sun. The natives still keep up an old custom of theirs which cannot be comforting to an invalid, when they think a sick friend is going to die, a couple of dozen neighbors surround his hut and keep up a deafening wailing night and day till he either dies or gets well. No doubt this arrangement has helped many a subject to a shroud before his appointed time. They surround a hut and wail in the same heartbroken way when its occupant returns from a journey. This is their dismal idea of a welcome. A very little of it would go a great way with most of us.